hi there how are you doing uh, in this video we are going to generally be looking at the topic of statutory interpretation but more specifically we are going to cover what are known as the primary aids of interpretation which include the little rule um, uh, the golden rule and also the mischief rule and then also under the secondary aids of construction we are going to be looking at aspects such as the Hansard we'll be looking at rules including the Jusdem Generis rule I uh, will also be looking at the rule uh, known as Nostura Sources. We'll also be looking at other aids such as the dictionary, um, other aspects, uh, for example, to include uh, judicial precedents, among others. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, my name is Mutiaba Conrad, a lawyer and a private law tutor, and uh, today I'm going to be basically taking you through this topic in material detail. But before we start, it's also very important to note that for students that are uh, interested in private law tutorial sessions, please feel free to contact us. Our number is down in the description box. And once again, you really need this mentorship. It's very important. And students who have actually gotten onto this mentorship program have been proven to outperform their fellows who lack any sort of mentorship. So please contact us. Our numbers are down in the description box. So once again, uh, the topic we are looking at is statutory interpretation, and we are going to start by basically uh, defining what statutory interpretation is about. And uh, by way of definition, statutory interpretation is basically a process of ascertaining or discovering the meaning of words used in a statute and the intention of parliament in passing the law. Now, what you have to note here is that uh, statutory interpretation okay here we are looking at court trying to interpret what certain words or certain sections of the act mean it's also important to note that these rules we are going to look at whereas they apply for interpretation of statutes but they can also apply for interpretation of other documents generally so having laid down the definition let's now proceed to look at the rules of interpretation. These rules of interpretation carry with them a number of names. Uh, some scholars in other textbooks, they are also referred to as the canons of construction. And also other scholars also refer to them as primary aids of interpretation. So any of these three can actually mean more or less the same thing. So the first rule that we are going to look at is what is known as the literal rule. So basically, when we are talking of the literal rule, this is basically a rule that court can apply in interpreting certain sections or certain words or provisions of an act of parliament. Now, the little rule requires words of a statute to be construed in their plain, natural, and ordinary meaning. The rule presumes that words chosen by parliament show clearly its intentions in passing the act. Okay? That's what you basically have to note, that the literal rule, court is applying the words the way they are, giving them their plain and natural meaning, okay? without adding any other aspect on the words. Okay? Uh, I'm going to share with you an interesting case uh, of R versus Harris. It's a case of 1836, 7 C and P, page 446. This case tries to illustrate uh, the application of the literal rule, uh, uh, basically by court. Uh, basically, in this case, a statute made it an offense, open quotations, to stab, comma, cut, or wound, close quotations, another person. Now, Harris beat off her friend's nose in a fight and then the policeman's finger as well. Court held that she was not guilty under the statute. The words in the statute pointed to the use of a weapon. And court concluded that the he, court concluded that actually Harris had used his teeth, and the teeth did not amount to a weapon. So again, we are seeing uh, that even though uh, the, the the section of the act created an absurdity, but actually court went on to give the words their natural, uh, ordinary, and plain meaning because the statute was talking of a weapon. Okay, the use of a weapon, and Harris had actually used his teeth and that did not uh, amount to a weapon. So court applied at uh, the literal rule, gave words their ordinary plain and natural meaning, and eventually 
court concluded that actually Harris was not liable for the offense. The other interesting case again on the literal rule is the case of um, Fisher versus Bell. You may have met this case in your contract law. Uh, this is a case of 1961, uh, volume one, Queen's Bench, page 394. Basically, the facts of this case were that an act of 1959 made it an offense to sell or hire or offer for sale or hire certain offense weapons such as, a, such as flicker knives. Now, Bell placed a flicker knife on his Bristol window with a price tag on it. And of course, uh, court held in the circumstances that applying the literal rule, Bell wasn't guilty. That was actually the holding of court. Court stated that Bell was not guilty because he was arrested and prosecuted for offering a flicker knife for sale. And of course, the rationale of this judgment was that placing a knife on display wasn't an offer, rather an invitation to treat uh, under contract law, as you may have uh, studied. Now, if, for example, the statute had used, okay, the phrase, let's say, expose for sale, then the answer would have been different. Then court would have arrived at a different conclusion, but the statute didn't. So court gave these words their natural, plain meanings, uh, meaning and stated that actually displaying a knife for sale did not amount to an offer for sale, but rather it was simply an invitation to treat. And of course, in the circumstances, uh, the accused was acquitted. So again, we are seeing uh, how the literal rule applies. Okay, But then what happens in the event that by applying the literal rule, you actually create an absurdity, okay? Which in the view of court, uh, the members of parliament could not have intended to, to actually be the case. In such a, a scenario, court will fall back to a second rule, which is known as the golden rule, okay? We, it's known as the golden rule, but we always uh, add them together. And we call it the golden rule and the purposive rules. Because in applying the golden rule, court looks at the purpose, okay? What was the purpose in creating the act? So golden rule and purposive rule. That is our second rule that we're going to look at. Now, this rule is an adaptation, it's simply an adaptation of the literal rule which we just looked at. It tells you to read the word in the context of a statute as a whole. That in case you look at a word or you read a certain section and you see that it is actually creating a certain absurdity, then you read the whole section, okay, and the whole um, act. You read the whole act so that you put it in context. Now here, you take the whole statute as a whole. When you're looking at the golden rule, you take the whole statute as a whole and construe it together. You interpret it the whole of it. You don't just look at a mere word and a section, but you rather look at the whole act holistically, giving the words their ordinary meaning, unless, of course, if so applied, it produces an inconsistency, an absurdity, or an inconvenience, which is so great as to convince court that the intention could not have been to use them in their ordinary meaning and to justify the court in putting on some other signification, which though less proper, is the one which the court thinks the words will bear. Now, again, for purposes of emphasis, you only bring in the golden rule where the literal rule has created an absurdity, okay? And in the opinion of court, that it could not have, uh, the, the parliament could not have intended that the absurdity is actually the position. That is when you actually go on to apply what we have called the golden rule. So I'm going to share with you uh, a certain important aspect, uh, which is that you only depart from the literal rule only when, one, there is a clear and gross anomaly. Okay? So you only leave the literal rule to proceed to apply the golden rule if, one, there is a clear and gross anomaly, either by the section or by a certain wording in the section. Two, Parliament could not have envisaged the anomaly and would not have accepted its presence. So if Parliament could not have seen that actually uh, the certain section or an act was going to create an anomaly 
and that had parliament seen that anomaly it could not have accepted such an anomaly that parliament would actually have gone on to correct that word or that section thirdly the anomaly can be obviated without detriment to the legislative intent that that anomaly can actually be corrected without necessarily a damaging okay or causing detriment to the intention of the legislation or rather to the intention of the parliament in creating such uh, an act then lastly the language of the statute allows for such modification so the language used in the statute must allow must allow court that modification to add on other words so as to give that specific section or word um, a passive okay uh, meaning so as to do away with the absurdity of course uh, all these rules that i've shared with you the four we are provided for in the case of holding uh, in the case of stock versus frank jones tipton limited it's a case of 1978 uh, volume one all england all reports page 943 you'll uh, go and look at the judgment of lord simon who provided for those uh, four aspects where you depart from the literal rule to proceed and apply the golden rule so that must be uh, taken very importantly now having laid down the circumstances where you depart from the literal rule to go and apply the golden rule i'm now going to share with you a very interesting case to show you how actually the golden rule operates okay in practice now in the case of ara versus allen it's a case of 1872 lr um, 1 ccr page 367 allen who was already married okay very interesting case married a woman called harriet so he was already married but he still proceeded to marry another woman who was actually called harriet now the statute prohibited a second marriage when already married to a person who is still alive and it actually went on to make it an offense of bigamy in case you married another person when you're still married to another person who is actually still alive now harriet was in fact related to allen okay so not only did actually not only did he marry her who was a second wife which was an offense of bigamy but actually he was also related to her as well now um harriet was in fact related to allen that in fact the bigamous marriage was void in law because remember when you marry someone who you're related to the position of the law even in uganda and indeed in most parts of the world is that such a marriage is void Okay, because there is that um, uh, consanguinity, there is that relation by blood which is very close. So such a marriage would be void. So meaning that in law, that marriage would be void since they were related. Now, Allen argued that he had not married Harriet because at law, this was impossible. Because you could not marry someone you're related to as that would amount to a void marriage. And so he had not committed bigamy and that a second marriage had to be legal before bigamy is committed so that is what actually allen was trying to argue in court that he had not committed bigamy why because he married a relative and as such the position of the law was that such a marriage was void now uh, had court accepted this interpretation which was actually logically right legally right it would actually have created an absurdity by allowing people to go on and marry other people if they are related to them and the law uh, does not hold them accountable because remember the statute actually prohibited a second marriage now what the judges um, did they took a more purposive approach and read the section okay there was that section that said shall marry as meaning not marriage in the sense okay but going through the ceremony of marriage and of course they ended up finding uh, allen liable so court stated that the term shall marry did not necessarily, necessarily mean that the marriage in itself should be a valid, a valid marriage. But provided you go through a ceremony of marriage, then you would have actually um, married that person. And of course, Allen was found liable. Another interesting case on the same principle that I'll share with you is the case of Re Sigsworth. It's a case of 1935 chancellery page 89 it's also reported in 1934 
calling landlord reports rip page 113. Now the facts of this case are also very interesting. Miss Sigsworth was murdered by her son who was also found dead. Her will left every wealth to her son. However, an old public policy rule dictated that the son couldn't inherit in such circumstances. Therefore, Miss Sigsworth died intested, meaning that he died without leaving a will. Why? Because um, an old public policy rule stated that in case a son kills uh, their parent for purposes of getting wealth, then they cannot actually inherit such wealth. Okay, so meaning that uh, if they applied that public law policy, then uh, that means that the lady would have died in test state without a will. And under the Administration of Estates Act of 1925, the person is entitled, uh, the person who is entitled on intestacy was actually her son. Okay, so the law even provided that in case someone dies without leaving a will, or in case someone uh, the law takes it that someone has not left a will. The person who will inherit the property will still be the son. And remember, the son is the one who had murdered the mother, although even the son had actually been found dead. Meaning that the property and the money would then move on to the children of the son. Okay? Now, uh, and through him, of course, uh, through the son, the property would still go back to the grandchildren. And the money had gone around in circles, okay? The, the money was still going back. No matter which law they applied, it would still go back to the son who had actually killed the mother. Now, court held that the statute could not have been intended to allow murderers to inherit despite being a silent on that point. The old rule which applied to inheriting under a will was applied to intestacy as well. So court went on to state that the other rule which actually um, prohibited the public policy rule that prohibited uh, children from inheriting property where they had actually killed their parents, even applied in situations where uh, there was intestacy, okay? Because remember, they had uh, interpreted to say that, look, the mother has died intestate, this child cannot actually benefit. And actually, the law also provided that in case the mother dies intestate, then that means the property would still pass on to the same uh, to the same child. So court applied that um, policy rule, the old uh, public policy rule, to also cover situations where actually a person dies in test state. And of course the property was never, the property and money was never given to the son. Let's now proceed to look at the third uh, rule, which is the mischief rule. Now the mischief rule stresses the need to interpret an enactment in such a way as to give effects to, to its objectives. So here you interpret an act and the intention is to give effect to its objectives. The rule directs you to look at the previous common law and the history of the act or document to see what was wrong with the law. What was the mischief? So you have to look at what was the mischief that the draftsman sought to remedy. So here when we are applying the mischief rule, we will always look at what was the absurdity before this new act was actually brought into place. And the draftsmen or draftswomen, what were they trying to remedy? Okay, that is uh, basically how the mischief rule will operate in the circumstances. It's also important to note when you're applying the mischief rule that in applying this mischief rule, courts are required to consider four things. So four aspects must be considered whenever you're applying the mischief rule. One, what was the common law before the act? Meaning that what was the old position before this new act was brought into place? Secondly, what was the defect or mischief for which the common law didn't provide? What was that challenge that actually the act did not provide for that is being remedied uh, or solved in the new act? Number three, what remedy did parliament intend to provide? Meaning that what was the new solution that Parliament was bringing in the new Act. And then number four, what was the true reason for that remedy? Why was uh, Parliament trying to bring this remedy? What were they trying to cure? So those are basically are the four requirements that you're supposed to look at when you're applying the mischief rule. And of course, these requirements were clearly laid down in Haydon's case, a case of 1584, uh, volume three, CORIP, 
7S7B, and it is actually the locus classicus on this uh, rule. Uh, let's now proceed to look at a case uh, putting this rule in play, and that is Goris versus Scott. It's a case of 1874 LR9EX125. In this case, basically, Scott contracted to transport some sheep by sea. The sheep were swept overboard because they hadn't been fenced in. Orders made under the Contagious Disease Act of 1869 required that sheep should have been put in their pens. Goris thus claimed that Scott was in breach of the act. Why? Because he hadn't put the sheep in the pen and as such, they slid off the sheep and fell in the lake. Court held that the purpose of the act, as clear from the preamble, was to prevent the spread of diseases among the sheep and cattle en route to Britain, and not to give a right to claimants such as Goris. So again here we are seeing court trying to apply to say that, look, yes we agree, your sheep sli slipped and fell in the water, but however, the purpose of, these, of putting these goats and sheep in pens was actually not to protect accidents per se, but it was actually intended to ensure that uh, diseases are not trans transmitted between these animals. And therefore, court uh, applied the mischief rule by looking at what was the mischief or the absurdity in the old act and what was uh, Parliament trying to remedy in the new act by providing for the requirement of uh, pens whereby uh, sheep will be separated from cattle. Another interesting case, again on the same principle, to illustrate it further, is the case of Smith versus Hughes, the case of 1960, Volume 1, Weekly Law Reports, page 830. It's also another interesting case to illustrate this principle. And basically, uh, in this case, Section 1 of the Street Offense Act of 1959 uh, made it an offense for a common prostitute to loiter or to solicit in a street or public place for the purpose of prostitution. Prostitutes be began attracting customers by signaling to men from balconies or windows by raising three fingers and receiving counter offers of three of two fingers. Court held that the mischief of the act was to clean up the streets. Court rejected the defense that they had not committed the offense because they were not on the streets but rather on balconies and in houses. Court applied the mischief rule as to the meaning of the word in the street. Because you see what had happened here is that the prostitutes, the moment they passed a law, they moved from the street and started to solicit on the balconies and inside the buildings through windows. And when they were arrested, their argument was that, look, for us we are not on the streets, the act prohibits um, prostitution on the street. For us we are actually up on the balconies and in the houses, but we are doing our business through the windows. Court rejected that argument, stating that the mischief of the act, okay, uh, or what they actually intended to remedy in the new act, was to prevent inconvenience and that act of soliciting on the streets. And that streets did not necessarily mean uh, you being down on the walkways, but it also included the prostitutes that were actually standing on the balcony and soliciting through the windows. Again, we see court applying the mischief rule. Now, having looked at those uh, primary rules of interpretation, let's now proceed to look at secondary aids to construction. Okay, the other those three are primary. We are now going to look at secondary aids to construction. Now, these secondary aids of construction can be applied within the framework of the primary aids, basically to facilitate interpretation. These are further divided into what we call intrinsic and extrinsic aids. So. All these fall under secondary aids of construction. They are just divided into two. Intrinsic to mean those that are within the act and extrinsic to mean those aids that are out of the act. Let's now proceed to first look at intrinsic aids of construction. The first intrinsic aid is what we call the title of the act. So each act has a title. That title is an intrinsic aid and it can be used in interpretation. Now, the long and short title are rarely used for this purpose. You should note that these are rarely used for the purpose of construction. But however, in Vanka versus London Society of uh, Compositors, it's a case of 1913 SC, page 107, 
the House of Lords referred to the long title of the Act, but only and strictly only to supplement and explain the meaning of the words in the section, not to contradict them. So this long title will only be referred to for purposes of explaining a certain section, okay, and not to contradict the section per se. Let's proceed to look at the second uh, intrinsic aid, and that is what is known as the rule of ejus dem generis. So basically, the rule of ejus dem generis, here, where your general words follow a list of specific words, then the general words must be read according to the genus. Genus means the type or group of the preceding specific words. Please note. Thus, we must discover the genus. You must always try and find the genus when you're going to apply the Jusdem generis rule, which uh, gen the genus which our named categories have in common. And then interpret the general words so that they don't conflict with the specific words. This is known as the Jusdem generis. Now, I'm going to give you an example to illustrate this. I know it's getting a bit, a bit bumpy. Now, for example, you may find that an act states that you need a license to keep, your, uh, to keep at your home, let's say, a lion, a cheetah, or a jaguar. And then it goes on to say, and other animals. Okay, a certain section of the act is saying, you need a license to keep a lion, a cheetah, a jaguar, and other animals. Now, if you're found with a German shepherd, let's say, at your home, can we say that you needed a license to keep the German shepherd? Because you see, your argument would be that a German shepherd falls under other animals as used in the statutes. So can we say that you needed a license? Here, what we are saying is that if we are going to interpret the word other animals, we must first find the genus or the category or the group of a lion, a cheetah, and a jaguar. And you will quickly realize that these three animals are actually wild animals. Whereas a German shepherd, although it's a vicious animal, but it is a domestic animal. And as such, what does that mean? That would mean in the premises that someone keeping a German shepherd by virtue of that section of the law actually doesn't need a license. I hope that is very clear. I'm going to encourage you to go and read the case of Marseille versus Bolden. It's a case of 2002 EWCA Civil, page 1634, it actually shows uh, how court applied the Jusdem Generis rule. Let's now proceed to look at another interesting rule known as Nostura Sources. Now, this rule basically provides that a word is known by its associates. That if you want to know what a word means, you look at the surrounding words that it is within or that it is with. The meaning of a word is affected by the surrounding words and should be interpreted accordingly. For example, an act of parliament may state that one of the ways of revoking a will okay, is by, open quotations, burning, comma, tearing, mutilating, or defacing. Okay? Now, one would ask, for example, what if the will had been partially destroyed by fire? Okay. How should you read the word burning? Does the burning have to be complete before the will is revoked? Or is partial burning enough by itself? Now, from the surrounding words, especially mutilating and defecting and defacing, it seems that actually this act doesn't have to be complete. Because you see, mutilating and defacing, it doesn't have to be complete, okay? That burning could be read as including partial burning. So in the circumstances, we will conclude, okay, that burning also includes partial burning where, let's say, a wheel uh, was partially burnt, let's say, in a house. That would also actually include uh, burning. So I hope you're seeing how the Nestura sources rule applies, Okay. I'm also going to share with you a very interesting case of uh, Tektrol Limited versus International Insurance Company of Hanover Limited and another. It's a case of 2005 EWC Civil, page 845. This case illustrates the Nostura Sources rule at play. 
Now, the brief facts are that Texto lost its computer source code by an unusual series of unrelated incidents, which included both a computer virus attacking the source code and also burglary. Tektro lost all its copies of that code and sought to recover money from its insurance policy because it had insured its uh, laptops and machineries and also its source code, the software. So because it had lost the same to burglary and a computer virus, so it proceeded now to ask for compensation from the insurance uh, company. Now, when they were in court, basically, the case hinged on what was meant by loss in the insurance policy. That's where the dispute was. What amounted to a loss? Of course, the insurance company did not want to compensate. And the argument of the insurance company was loss did not include uh, uh, the loss of the source code, the software. So for them, they only wanted to cover the burglary. But the owner, uh, that is Tektrol, the company, actually stated that no, the loss even included the loss of the software. So they are also supposed to compensate us for the loss of the source code. Okay. Now, in giving the judgment, Sir Marin Noos concluded that the expression in the policy, in the insurance policy, okay, which was the form the contract, that the expression, open quotations, other erasure, comma, loss, distortion, or corruption of information, close quotations, demonstrates that the loss by means of electronic interference, nostura sources. So court was trying to say that when you look at the word loss and those other words that were surrounding it, such as erasure, loss, distortion, and corruption of information, all of them demonstrated that the loss, that the word loss was actually meaning is the loss of a, uh, by way of electronic interference, nostura sources. So court actually, that is just uh, Justice Sam Miriam Noos, applied the nostura sources rule by saying that if we are looking at whether the word loss also covered the loss of a source code by way of software, we'll then look at the surrounding words, okay? And court looked at erasure, loss, distortion, corruption, and said that all these words actually mean loss of electronic information or material and as such the word loss also covered the loss of the source code so again we are seeing a court trying to apply uh, the nostura associates rule in that way the other um uh, intrinsic aid is what we call inclusory words and lists from the word inclusion now the word that often arises in a statute is the word include. You'll find some statutes which have the word include, okay? For example, a section may read, open quotations, for purposes of this act, equipment includes any plant and machinery, comma, vehicle, comma, aircraft and clothing. The question then would be whether the word include meant that all the subsequent terms were included and everything else excluded. Or did the word include mean that the subsequent terms were examples only so that other terms may also be included? That is where normally that word included becomes a bit technical. Now, let me share with you an interesting case to show this rule in play. You look at the case of Coltman versus uh, BB Tankers. It's a case of 1988, SC page 276. It's also reported in 1987, volume 3, All England Law Reports, page 1068. Now, in this case, a ship sank off the coast of Japan, killing an engineer. His estate, that is the estate of the engineer, sued, uh, of course, the company that owned the ship, arguing that the ship was defective equipment. Now, the House of Lords had to decide whether Section 1 uh, could include a ship. The section actually stated, open quotations, equipment includes any plant and machinery, vehicle, aircraft, and clothing. The House of Lords looked at other sections in the statute which were very specific 
when not introduced by the word include, and held that although a ship was not mentioned in the act specifically, it was nevertheless included in the definition of equipment. So again, uh, this is also an intrinsic aid. Court will look at uh, the word include, and it will generally look at other sections in the act. What do they say? And it will again look at the intention of the legislators, and then it will then make a ruling on the same. So having looked at those intrinsic aids of statutory interpretation, let's now proceed to look at the extrinsic aids. Remember we said that extrinsic aids, these are aids that come from out of the act that will help court in interpreting a certain section or a certain statute. The other, the, 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 the first one is the Interpretation Act. Now there's a, an act known as the Interpretation Act Cap 3, okay? When you go to this act, it lays down various definitions of certain words. For example, when you look at section 3, it states that words importing the masculine gender shall include females as well. So if you find a word in the statute saying males and it has left out females, it also actually includes females as well. So you also, when court is interpreting some of these sections, it can also refer to the Interpretation Act because it generally governs uh, interpreting of statutes and documents. Then the other one, next is what we call judicial precedence. Now, when court is trying to interpret certain sections, it will also basically look at judicial precedence. Because you see, there are some cases where a court has actually interpreted some sections. So court can actually refer to those interpretations by judges in previous cases and hold that such interpretations are binding, of course, subject to the doctrine of stare decisis. Next are what we call dictionaries. Now, important to note that in interpreting sections and acts of parliament, court will always refer to dictionaries, or it may choose, it's not mandatory, but it may choose to refer to them. And of course, uh, courts will uh, always refer to what we call um, legal dictionaries. For example, the Black Laws Dictionary by Brian A. Garner. It will refer to it. It's only if such a law dictionary does not, you know, for one reason, provide for the definition of a certain word that court can refer to, let's say, the Oxford Dictionary, among others. The other uh, extrinsic aid is what we call punctuation and marginal notes. So basically, in interpreting statutes, court will also look at these punctuations. So when you find a comma or a full stop or a colon or a semicolon in an act of parliament, it's not by accident. Court can also refer to these punctuations or to even marginal notes. Okay, marginal notes are always those small words that are written in the, you know, in the statute to try and explain the section. Although in Uganda, these are not very common. They are in very few acts. But the modern view is that punctuation can be used as an aid to interpretation, as was held in the case of Ara versus Montilla, a case of 2004, UKHL, page 50. It's also reported in 2004, volume 1, uh, weekly law reports, page 3141. Then lastly, uh, there is what we call the use of the Hansard or the Hansard. So in interpreting these statutes, court can actually also make a reference to the Hansard. A Hansard is basically a document uh, that is uh, used for purposes of records in parliament. Each parliament has a Hansard for communications made or debates when they are debating these acts, making amendments, and so on, uh, such statements are recorded in a document known as a Hansard. So in interpreting statutes, court can actually refer to the Hansard to try and interrogate or and examine what actually the intentions of the members of parliament was or what they intended to actually insert in the act. Of course, authority for that position can be found in the Locus Clascus case of Pepper versus Hart. It's a case of 1992, Volume 1, All England Law Reports, uh, page 42. Now here, in this case, basically, the House of Lords accepted that actually in interpretation of statutes, reference can always be made to the use of the Hansard, although, please note, in limited circumstances. So this 
is not generally used, but in lit written in limited circumstances, which were actually even laid down by the House of Lords in that case. I encourage you to go and look at those limited circumstances. Otherwise, ladies and gentlemen, that was all on statutory interpretation. Once again, I encourage you to subscribe to my channel, to like and share with your colleagues. And then again, students interested in private law tutorial sessions, please feel free to contact us. Uh, for a private arrangement. Our numbers are down in the description box. You can call us for a private arrangement. Thank you very much. We meet in another class. Bye-bye.